authors that we're going to have today. But we start off with Robert Griffin III from ESPN, Heisman Trophy winner, College Football Hall of Fame, Texas Sports Hall of Fame, Texas High School Football Hall of Fame, and a great friend of the show. Hey, uh, you know what? You've had to kind of relaunch your career with the broadcasting. We had to relaunch ours two years ago. Thanks, man, for being a part of this uh, second year anniversary show. Hey, man, no problem at all. You know, you guys are the best. I uh, got a lot of respect for you. So I'm happy to be on the show and celebrate with you guys. Robert, what was that first year of broadcasting like for you? And how do you and what do you do in the off season compared to what you did as an athlete to get ready for year two? Well, I got to say it was a blessing, you know, very unexpected, uh, a lot of fun. You know, I got to call a couple of Baylor games as well, you know, be there for homecoming. So that was nostalgic for me. Um, but for me, my schedule hasn't changed. I still work out uh, as if I'm playing, uh, continuing to prepare uh, for that call to come. Uh, but when it comes to broadcasting, you know, just being around the game, being able to see what's going on in spring practice and, and understand all the moves that are being made, uh, really get you prepared to tell the stories for the teams and the universities uh, when the when the fall comes. Robert, what was the the I don't know the challenge, but the I mean, clearly because they ESPN really lets you show your personality and you're such a humor. Maybe it's something that people probably didn't get to see with with you when you're a player that much because it's it you don't get that much time to do that. But finding the the rhythm between you and Mark Jones and showing your personality and and not just being a kind of a straight X and O broadcast. Yeah, you know, I would say that, you know, your, your point about people not really getting to see your personality when you're a player is true. One, we have helmets on all the time. And two, when our press conferences, we're not really trying to be funny. You know, we're trying to, to lead a team, lead an organization. So um, being a broadcaster, the, the best thing that or best advice I ever got was be yourself. Uh, and that's what I tried to do um, in the booth with Mark Jones. He was phenomenal. You know, he's got years and years of experience and he made it so much easier for me him our producer Ken Belton our sideline guy Quint Kessinick everybody together it was just it flowed really really well and they just told me you know don't be afraid be yourself go out there and I kind of took that to heart so I wasn't afraid to say uh things that some people might think are funny some people didn't think they were funny you know it didn't matter just having fun and that energy came through uh, on the broadcast and you know I'm uh, extremely proud about that there's a lot of times where the media might not be so popular and it might be their own doing. And there's a lot of times, you know, athletes uh, can get kind of tired of the media and the way things are painted. Has being in the media given you a different perspective than when you were an athlete? Yeah, what I would say is, you know, coming into the media game, everybody, or should I say players, are concerned about what you just said. And for me, it was, can you do this? Be yourself. Um, you know, say the truth and not have to necessarily say anything that you don't believe in. And that's rung true for me this entire time. I've been able to go out and whether it's in the studio or in the broadcast booth, see myself, uh, say the things that I believe in, you know, stand my ground on the convictions that I have, uh, but not go out there and unnecessarily, you know, burn any bridges or, or try to tear anybody down. I think, you know, it's our job in the media to tell players stories correctly um, because what we say about them on the air travels with them for the, the longevity of their careers. And I was a guy uh, that had some stuff that was spoken about me that was untrue. And I don't want to do that uh, to other players. I don't want to do that to coaches or GMs. So uh, I make sure I go out there and I, and I say what I believe and I leave it at that and, and have fun with it. So that was uh, something that I has, haven't really had an issue with. Uh, and I think, you know, the circles that I'm in when I go work out and, and these guys are constantly coming up to me and telling me, um, you know, that they think I'm killing it. And, that you know, that's the, the biggest stroke of confidence I can get is from my peers to, to feel that way about me. I asked you this before, but I was going to ask you now that the season's over and you've been through it, what was – what is uh, – not no more complicated, what, what is more difficult, planning for X's and O's of an opponent, watching that film, or planning for a broadcast of two teams you're going to do? Uh, I would say it's, it's probably tougher – broadcasting for two different teams, you know, two different sets of traditions. Um, in college football, it's a, the roster turnover is so high, and you've got the transfer portal now. So keeping up to date with who's on the team, where they're from, what their story is, how to tell that story, how long has this coach been there, who moved here, is a lot more difficult than planning for the X's and O's 
of a cover two defense versus a quarters defense versus cover six versus which linebacker, this pass rusher, um, that part of it makes it easier for me to navigate broadcasting. Um, playing the game is harder than broadcasting the game, but studying for the broadcasting is, uh, I, would, I would say, significantly more difficult than studying to play a game that you love and have played for the last 20 years. What was it like to jump in and not only a year that you know, college football was back with fans in the stands after you know uh, the full-blown part of, of, of COVID-19 and then uh, all the issues that popped up, Big 12 realignment, uh, name image likeness, you know, the, the transfer portal really last year was the year where we really get to see what that means where you get to transfer and play right away. Yeah, I mean, there was no shortage of storylines, right? Uh, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. You know, at ESPN, we called it the, you know, the welcome home because the the beauty of college football is the pageantry. It is the fans. It is the mascot, right? For Baylor, it's, it's the Baylor line and, and the opportunity to run the Baylor line before the game against BYU on the field <laughs> with the press was phenomenal, right? I got to do that with my wife. That's a memory that we're going to have for the rest of our lives. So to really enjoy that part of it was so cool. Uh, and then for me, being my first year in broadcasting, I got to experience so much uh, on from the front lines, right? From the different fan bases, from the different traditions that they have in the city, where they eat, what they do after the game. And that was fascinating for me. It, it kind of added more to the love of football that I already have from playing the game, calling the game was something that I never thought I would ever do. Uh, but it's a blessing that God has placed in my life, and I plan on taking full advantage of it. Robert, you mentioned that uh, you know you've done a couple Baylor games along the way, and obviously you've kept in touch with the program. I mean, they're they're back to spring ball. So last year, you know, it's just a memory more than anything else. But it's a good memory. I mean, what a run! Big Twelve champs, Sugar Bowl champs. I don't think we've got to hear your thoughts. Just kind of on the the summary of the season. What were they, and uh, you know, how impressed were you with how they were able to turn things around? Oh, I mean, I mean, come on. What with my analyst had on today, it was it was phenomenal. You know, defense really showed up big late in the year, being able to hold the teams that they were playing, especially Ole Miss, um, to minimal points and allow the offense to kind of grind things out. Uh, you know, it was great to see Gary Mahanan, um go out there and show what type of player he can be as the starting quarterback. And then also Blake Shapin coming in and, you know, completing his first 17 passes uh, in, in his first start and, and helping the Baylor Bears win the Big 12 championship. So it, it was very awesome from an analyst standpoint. But just being an alumni, um, I mean, it just makes you proud to be a Bear, uh, to see what they did coming from the previous year and then having one of the best seasons in uh, arguably in program history, winning 12 games, winning the Big 12, and winning the Sugar Bowl. Um, so I think it was just something that, you know, you look at Coach Aranda and you say, you know, job well done. He's He's not going to celebrate after anything, and I know that they've already moved on. I've been I've been listening to the press conferences, and you know they're <laughs> they're trying. To get it. But looking back at last year, it was a very very special season, and I know they're looking to build on it. They got a lot of pieces to replace. Robert, the quarterbacks you mentioned, Gary Bohannon and Shape, and what he did all the way up until and through the uh, Big Twelve Championship game, and they have a competition going on. Gary, right now, getting most of the reps. You have been in that role, of course, as a freshman walking on campus. Everyone knew it was a matter of time. Your thoughts about a quarterback competition? Can it fuel a team to become better, or is there sometimes a concern if it doesn't go well? Uh, you know, I think in this situation. Uh, both Gary and Blake, you know, they're brothers, you know, and, and uh, you know, I have an opportunity to mentor Gary uh, and I know how they feel about each other. So I think in their situation, it's unique um, because they're so close and, and Gary went out and proved that he can, he can be the starter for the, for the long haul. And, and Shaden went out there and showed that he's not just a backup quarterback uh, and that he can play at a high level as well. So I think in this situation, it will strengthen the team because you got to give Blake an opportunity to go out there and prove it. And then Gary just gets to go out there and, and stamp it, you know, stamp that he is the guy, um, despite anything that happened later later in the year. And he did go out there and lead him to a victory in the Sugar Bowl. So uh, I think Coach Rand is going to manage it the right way. Sean Bell is going to manage it the right way so that it will actually benefit the team uh, in this situation. And Gary's going to continue to get the majority of the reps as long as he continues to prove that he's that guy. And I think he's going to keep doing that. Uh, and the Bears are going to be better for it. Not just this upcoming season, but also into the future because it's the fifth year for Gary. So mm -hmm. at some point, he make that transition to the NFL, um, you know, prayerfully. 
And and Saban's going to have to step in and take it and kind of look at it with what happened with me and Nick Florence and then Nick Florence and Bryce Petty. Right? You've got to have great quarterback play geared up and ready to go. And uh, there's a, there's one thing I we never did win when I was a starting quarterback, and that's the Big 12 championship. But that's because when after we left, the team was better for it because of the, the foundation in that quarterback room to where Nick comes in and then Bryce comes in and wins, I think, two Big 12 championships. So it, it, it's all, it all works together. And in the long haul, uh, with, which what Coach Dave Aranda is there for, it'll benefit them by having this competition and having Blake Shapen ready to go for years to come. Robert, do you introduce yourself to people as a Heisman Trophy winner, ESPN broadcaster, or TikTok star, Robert Griffin? Ah. <laughs> uh, okay, that's, that's, that's a good one. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I, will, I will say this. We went out to, uh, to L.A. for the Super Bowl, and more people approached me and my wife about TikTok than anything else. So – if, if you want to call us TikTok stars, if you want to have some fun, go look at our TikTok, the Griffin family. We're, we're having a bunch of fun there with, with uh, the kids, the wife, and just doing funny videos. Um, it's just another element, man. TikTok's one of the most visited. I think it is the most visited website in the entire world. And there is a lot of fun that happens on there. So we just wanted to be a part of that and really open people's eyes to a different side of our family. So, Robert, um, one of my uh, college roommates today, when he found out we were going to have you on the show, he said, I've never asked you this, so I have to, because I'm a Florida State alum, just like your wife. And he said, not that, you know, you're going to direct your kids, your daughters to go anywhere, but he (laughs) just wants to know that Florida State will have a fair shot when it comes time for your kids to go to school. Yes, listen, that's a constant conversation in the household. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Baylor Bay through right and, and when, I, when I put the analyst hat on and I'm calling a Baylor game I have to be unbiased but when we're not calling games we're completely biased so I'm definitely I definitely want them to go to Baylor but FSU does have a fair shot my wife is a, a seminal through and through and uh, we're not going to direct our girls to, to go anywhere in particular um, so that that being said Baylor and Florida State will both be in the running uh, for our girls to go there. Look, if I have to get a statue of Greta at Florida State, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she already has the uh, – she's the heptas- mom record holder at the <laughs> school. So we had a we, – we went to do a Seminoles game uh, there at Florida State in Tallahassee, and we took a picture with, with the girls, so that was pretty cool. But, no, nah, seriously, we, uh, we love both schools. Um, you know, they, they might have some split shirts for a couple of years before they get to that. <laughs> but uh, – yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so one note about the quarterback. Uh, round table in some ways in the NFL. Aaron Rodgers signs a monstrous deal, earned it. He's back. Tom Brady announces his retirement, then decides he's coming back. Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, those are two stories. Russell Wilson to Denver. Deshaun Watson to Cleveland. Have you ever seen such, I don't know if it's tumultuous, but so many big things happening within the NFL in the offseason? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's by far the just most outrageous NFL offseason I've ever seen from a quarterback standpoint to the contracts that are coming out to how the receiver market is shot up to $30 million. Um, I mean, it, it's completely wild. You know, Russell going to the Broncos is a great get for Denver. Uh, probably not the greatest situation for Seattle, uh, but he won it out. So now he's got to prove that he can cook without the Legion of Boom and without beast mode. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic going on there in Denver uh, for Russell. And then Aaron, you know, just pulling off that massive contract that he got, like you said, he earned it. He earned every single bit of it. But for him to come back and Devontae Adams to get traded, that was, was a little weird to me. I felt like those two guys are force multipliers, right? They make each other better. They make the whole team better, not just the offense. Everybody feeds off their energy. So now where, where do you get that energy from? Uh, is it just from Aaron doing the championship belt celebration? You know who's he throwing the ball to? We don't even we don't know a lot of the guys that are that are on the roster right now. Um, and then Brady, I just think he he went home after he retired and he got tired of his kids. You know he was there every single day, and he realized that he needed to come back and play football. He wasn't done yet. Uh, so I thought I thought that was funny. He he basically retired for two months and and that was it. Um, and then Deshaun Watson, you know, just the decision for the Browns to make that move when they made it, when he has those 22 pending law, you know, lawsuits, civil lawsuits against him uh, for the sexual misconduct and, and, and assault. Uh, it, it's, it's weird timing that they did it then, but it just shows you that they're prioritizing winning 
um, and have and having a great player like Deshaun Watson is a great player on the field over anything that's happening off the field, and that's just interesting. I, I know the kids are calling, and uh, college football, you, of course, the Heisman Trophy, when you left and all the endorsements you had being the, the number one over, uh, number uh, two overall pick. Now today, NIL, now today, cost of living, athletes get that as well, and now they get academic bonus money, up to nearly $6,000. Some schools did that this year. Can you imagine your earning potential if you could be in the uh, college football game right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, you know, me and my wife were talking about it, and we we actually did a TikTok talking about it. I had the the, the chrome helmet, you know, the Baylor's <laughs> uh-huh. chrome helmet. Had to, they got to bring those back, right? I mean, those are incredible. Uh, so I had the chrome helmet, and we did you know a little TikTok skit, basically saying, "I wish I had a time machine so we'd go back to college and, and cash in on a lot of these NIL deals." <laughs> but you know, the thing I, I think the most of, of when I hear people ask me about that is just how happy I am for the players today. You know, when I was at Baylor, they actually taking money out of my pocket because I had an academic scholarship and a full ride uh, athletically, but it was capped at a certain amount of money that they could give uh, per semester. So essentially my academic scholarship went back to the school. Well, now, now that you talked about they're giving those stipends and guys are allowed to make money uh, NIL off the field, um, you know, I think that is something that would have benefited a lot of guys, uh, not just them personally with being able to eat, you know, food, have the right meals, but also to be able to help their families. Uh, college football for the longest has uh, marginalized its biggest asset, which is the players, the student athletes, male and female. So now to give them an opportunity to go out and make money, just like the universities make money off of them, just like the NCAA makes money off of them, uh, I think was monumental and, and shifts the balance in a positive way to the players, just like the transfer portal does. Mm-hmm. And then the opportunity to go, where they want to go or where they are needed or wanted the most at any given time. Robert, it means a lot for you uh, for you to be a part of the show when you are, but also today because it's the second anniversary of when we launched it, which you were a part of the first day. Thank you, as always. Look forward to seeing you very good. It was great to see you inducted into the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, which is one of the other ultimate honors you have. We appreciate your time. All right. Appreciate you guys, as always. I'm here when you need me. Anytime. Always proud to be a part of it. God bless. Robert Griffin III, Texas Sports Hall of Fame, Texas High School Football Hall of Fame, of course, Heisman Trophy winner, and a part of many things before it's all said and done. He'll be a part of, uh, of course, college football's various honors uh, down the road. When we come back, speaking of the Hall of Fame, baseball's about to start their season.